Greetings, everyone. I hope this finds you doing well today. I hope that in the next week that I can speak into your life about the events of the Passion Week in a way that's going to deepen your understanding. And we'll be covering the events that took place in this last week of Jesus' earthly life in a way that causes us to think about things maybe in a new way. But my goal each day is to be quick and concise to the point. And my goal is to keep each time about 10 to 15 minutes. So let's pray before we uh, tackle today's topic. Lord, thank you for today. I pray that you will use your word to speak into our lives today, that uh, as we talk about the clearing of the temple and what it represents, and, and specifically talking about even righteous anger, Lord, that you will use your word to uh, encourage us and convict us if we need to be convicted, but to teach us things and about Jesus' last week in his earthly life. Now, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So today when we talk about clearing the temple in Mark chapter 11, verse 12 through 19, as we look at this text, we see it, it's, it's talking about righteous anger. The trouble with righteous anger is that um, it is easy to be angry, but it's not easy to be righteous at the same time. But both are possible, and we see this example in Jesus' life. I want to propose a few questions in this topic before we get started. I want to ask you to think about how you would define righteous anger. Number one, and when you have seen it put into good use, number two, and number three, when has anger gotten the best of you? And lastly, uh, to ask God to show you and give you discernment of what your real cause of anger is as we look at that and we pray. Um, our text today comes from Mark 11, 12 through 19. I want to read through that. It says, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Now, I think Jesus does a great job of illustrating righteous anger here in this passage. We also see from his example that righteous anger needs to be combined with both prayer and forgiveness. We can see through his example how our emotions and our attitudes can, can work together to fulfill God's purpose and will instead of taking the path of a fleshly response. And I want you to think of this also. Yesterday, as we celebrated on Sunday, we witnessed this triumphal entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, a humble beast. Uh, so when we come to this text with the picture in our mind of Jesus being a gentle and humble person that just rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, um, just keep that in our minds. And Mark 11, 12 through 14, from this text, Jesus uses the fig tree as an illustration. And fig trees and, and vines are often used as symbols of Israel's faithfulness to God. God comes to his vineyard looking for grapes and figs, that is righteousness and justice and mercy. And therefore looking for fruit on the fig tree represents what Jesus is looking for in the temple. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 13, in the Revised Standard Version, it says, and I think it puts it best, it says, When I would gather them, says the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed away from them. So he's talking about the people of Israel. He's talking about gathering them together, and when he gathers them together, he finds no fruit there. So in other scriptural examples, and I'm not going to get into all these, but Jeremiah 29, 17 Hosea 9, 10 through 16, Joel chapter 1, verse 7, and also Micah chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. We learn things from them, too, concerning this. And now, there is a struggle with this text that we have to get past. The struggle is that it was not the season for figs in the first place. Fig trees around Jerusalem usually leaf out in about March or April, so right about the season we're in now. But they don't produce figs until June. 
And this tree was no exception, of course. It was in full leaf, but as Mark tells us, there were no figs on it because it was not the season for figs. So it is probably most helpful to see this as an acted out parable of the judgment that the temple faces. If you think about those being judged, judgment never comes when it is expected. The context of Jesus' comments from the Old Testament, we can look at Isaiah chapter 56, 4 through 8, and Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. And note verse 20, which is beyond our text, but it talks about the withered fig tree, which is found there. And that, that, that really uh, kind of summarizes what we're talking about in a way. But I want to go back to Mark chapter 11, verse 12 through 14. Now, Jesus is hunger in this illustration for what we have, uh, our experience and what we've read here, that leads us into this. The fig tree represents Israel, Hosea 9.10, Nahum 3.12, Zechariah 10.2. The tree is fully leafed out, and we might expect to find some fruit on it, but again, symbolizes the hypocrisy and the fraud or the hoax of the nation of Israel, which makes Israel ripe for judgment. A people which honored God with their lips, according to Mark chapter 7, verse 6, but whose heart was all the time far from him. And that was like that tree with abundance of leaves, but no fruit. And now we enter the picture of the temple in Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 19. And there it says, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches and those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Now this is found in all of the Gospels, but three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at the end of Jesus' ministry. There's a lot that can be spoken of here, but we are going to cut right to the chase. I like what one commentary says about the cleansing of the temple here, and I just want to quote what it says. This comes from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. It says, When Jesus entered the temple area, verse 15, the smell of the animals entered his nostrils, and the noise from the money changers' tables beat on his ears. For the convenience of pilgrims, the cattlemen, and the money changers had set up business in the court with the, of the Gentiles, and the animals were sold for sacrifices. And it was far easier for a pilgrim in Jerusalem to purchase one that was guaranteed kosher than to have to bring an animal with him and have it inspected for meeting the kosher requirements. Now, the Roman money the pilgrims brought to Jerusalem had to be changed into the Tyrian currency, the closest thing to the Hebrew shekel, to the old Hebrew shekel. And since the annual temple tax had to be paid in that currency, um, exorbitant prices were often charged for changing currency. By overturning the tables in the, of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, Jesus was directly challenging the authority of the high priest because they were the one they gave the authorization. In John's account, Jesus drove them out with a whip from pieces of rope. And Mark does not mention that whip, but nevertheless, the words driving out an overturned table suggest that, of course, Jesus used force. So jumping to verse 17 in Mark chapter 11, as he taught them, he says, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? The first passage quoted by Jesus is Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, a prediction that non-Jews who worship God will be allowed to worship in the temple. And by allowing the court of the Gentiles, the only place in the temple area where Gentiles were allowed to worship God, to become a noisy, smelly public market, the Jewish religious leaders were really preventing the Gentiles from exercising the spiritual privilege that was promised them. Now, how could a Gentile pray amid all that noise and all that stench? And God's house was supposed to be, as it says, to be a house of prayer for all nations. The second question, and the quotation here is, but you have made it a den of robbers. And that's from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, and emphasizes that, that instead of allowing the temple to be what it was meant to be, a place of prayer, they had allowed it to become a robber's den. 
And this is to be understood not so much in terms of the Jews' dishonest dealing with the pilgrims that were coming in, as in terms of their robbing the Gentiles by merchandising activities of their rightful claim to the worship of Israel's God. Now, the significance of the cleansing of the temple is that with the coming of the Messiah, Jesus seeks to make available to the Gentiles the privileges which belong to this new age and therefore really proclaims the time of universal worship uninhibited by Jewish restriction had come. So Jesus' action had challenged their authority and no doubt cost them a good deal of money. So the Pharisees and the Herodians in Galilee had decided that Jesus must be put out of the way. They must get rid of him. So Jesus' teaching was getting through to the people and they feared the response, what the people might, how the people might respond. And if he could persuade the people to follow him, Jesus, the power and the authority of the chief priests and the teachers of the law would be broken. So let's make application of this. And I want to ask Mike some questions. In what ways would Jesus' anger in this situation qualify as righteous anger? Again, then again, now make it personal. What activities or attitudes are there around us that get in the way of God's purposes? And what can we do, what can you do to help eliminate those? When you react to a situation with anger, how can you know whether that anger is from God or not? The scripture reminds us to confess any sins of anger that we may have. You know, anything that God shows us that we, we become aware of. Ask God to use us as a tool in prayer. And when we believe that God has things under or in his control, like our daily situations, how can we use our energies, or our anger, to bring about productive things that will help others in our society, the world that we live in? So when we think about the, the coronavirus, let's take our situation now. When we think about the coronavirus and all the stuff that's going on, what can we do? Is there a righteous anger that kind of rises up inside of us because of things that are going on? For example, maybe the way leaders are handling it. Not everybody's agreeing on that right now. Or how people are responding, whatever it may be. What is the productive way that we can use our righteous anger in the things being stirred in us? To pray, to ask, what can I do with that that's welling up within me? That it may be a, a righteous anger to, to help other people, to help our society, to help our world, to, to move forward in a very positive, productive way. And I think that's something we need to look at. In Scripture, it reminds us as we walk through this week, the Passion Week, and the things that Jesus did, he was angry because of what was going on in, temp in the temple. And that's why he went into the temple and he overturned the tables. And that's why he went into the temple and he made a big deal about it. Because what the temple was made for, God's purpose for the temple, was not being accomplished. And when he looks at our lives, he wants our lives to be used in a productive way to bring about his purposes and what he has designed us to do. So you see, according to the scripture, we are now the temple. So we need to look at our lives and see how can I allow God to work in me, the temple, and through me to bring about his purposes and produce good things. Let's pray. Let's begin to ask God, what way can you use me, God, to bring about something that's positive and productive with my righteous anger and with that which is rising up in me? Maybe things that are, are going on in our society right now. What can I do to help society through this? and make it a positive thing. So I want to just close in prayer and ask the Lord to help us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us by your word, that you are speaking to us about the things of the last week, the Passion Week, that you're speaking to us about the clearing of the temple and righteous anger and how we can handle things. And I pray even in the midst of our current conditions right now with the coronavirus and all that's going on, that maybe there's things rising up inside of us, righteous anger, things are welling up inside of us, and how we can look at that and we can be angry but yet righteous at the same time, that we can produce productive things in our lives that will help others, that we can love others through this, that we can serve others, that you can use us as your vessel, as your temple, to minister to the people around us and help us. Lord, I pray that you would do that, that you would speak to our hearts. And as we just move on through this week, God, speak to us about the things that Jesus went through that teaches us today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, thank you for joining us tomorrow. We'll get right back to it and look at the next piece, looking at the teaching on the Mount of Olives. God bless you today.